The Gospel lesson and sermon text for this morning is written for us in Luke chapter 6, beginning at the 17th verse. As is the custom of the church, please stand for the reading of the Gospel. He went down with them and stood on a level place with a large crowd of his disciples and a large number of, from all, excuse me, a large number of people from all Judea and Jerusalem, as well as from the coastal area of Tyre and Sidon. These people came to listen to him and to be healed of their diseases. Those who were troubled by unclean spirits were also cured. The whole crowd kept trying to touch him because power was going out from him and healing them. He lifted up his eyes to his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, because yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, because you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, because you will laugh. Blessed are you whenever people hate you, and whenever they exclude and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because of this. Your reward is great in heaven. In fact, the fact is, their fathers constantly did the same thing to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, because you are receiving your comfort now. Woe to you who are well fed now, because you will be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now because you will be mourning and weeping. Woe to you when all people speak well of you because that is how their fathers constantly treated the false prophets. So far our text, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we have come before you to be strengthened in our faith. We pray then that you would speak to us through your word. Heal us of all our diseases and drive out any doubts and fears. Make us confident that Jesus is our Savior. To these ends, sanctify us through the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Please be seated. In Jesus the Christ, dear fellow redeemed, God's grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father through our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Jesus' most famous sermon is his Sermon on the Mount. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 5 through to the end of chapter 7. And it's, it's said that in the first centuries of Christianity, so the first centuries after the apostles, more was written on the Sermon on the Mount than any other piece of the Scriptures, at least during that time. Here we have a different sermon of Jesus. We call this one the Sermon on the Plain. It's not as well known as the Sermon on the Mount and actually, people that are skeptical of the Bible and its accuracy would say that this Sermon on the Plain is, is really the same one, just Luke got a few details differently. It's true that there are some similarities between the sermon in front of us today and Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. For instance, the Beatitudes or the blessings at the end of our section. Jesus said similar statements in the Sermon on the Mount too. But does that mean that these are really one and the same thing and that Matthew wrote it one way and, and Luke wrote it another way and we just have to blend them together? Well, there's a couple of points that would help us understand that, no, these can be two different sermons. Okay. The first is that there is enough different 
about the events surrounding the Sermon on the Mount and this count, account here that they don't mesh very well. Even the Beatitudes seem to have a different emphasis, a slightly different emphasis here in Luke than they did in Matthew. Matthew doesn't include the woes at all. That would be a pretty big section to leave out of the Sermon on the Mount. Just put the blessings in and leave the woes out. The other factor is that we see a different focus here on the crowd or in the crowd. Here Luke explicitly records that the people came to listen to Jesus and to be healed of their diseases. No miracles are connected with the Sermon on the Mount. But here in in Luke's account on the Sermon on the Plain, it seems like that's a chief focus. That the miracles of Jesus are prominent in gathering the people together to hear him. And this Sermon on the Plain then helps us to see that Jesus wants to heal and to bless. The first part of our text is all about the healing power of Jesus. And through that healing power, he reveals that he is God. Now there are two planes of activity that we see in Jesus' healing power. The first is that he was healing people of physical diseases. And it, in a sense, in a mind-blowing way, it says that the power was going out from Jesus and the crowd was pushing in, just trying to touch him. Because one little touch of Jesus would heal the individual of whatever physical ailment they were suffering. That's incredible. Can you imagine having that power in our presence? Can you imagine that person going into the hospital and how everyone would want to gather around him? Cancer, COVID, strokes, heart attacks, wouldn't matter what it was, one touch would heal. Can you imagine the effect that that would have today if someone possessed that type of power? Do you think the people of Jesus' day were any different? when they saw Jesus' ability to rule the physical world, to be able to radically change their bodies with just a touch, they were blown away. They were amazed at His power because it revealed that He is God. The other plane of Jesus' activity is with unclean spirits or demons would be another way that we we speak of them. Now, skeptics too would approach this with regards to demon possession and say, well, people back then, they were just skeptical and led by myths and it wasn't really demons. It was just physical ailments or mental illnesses that that caused these things. The people weren't that stupid. And even if you would say they were ignorant, Jesus himself is not ignorant. And he clearly distinguishes between a physical ailment and demonic activity. Now, why do skeptics look at it this way? Well, we've traveled through what's called modernism, 
where everything must be proven, everything must be able to be measured and observed. And if I can't measure or observe it, I'm not going to believe it. In fact, I'm going to reject it. Having come through that, our culture is really biased against the supernatural, biased against the spiritual realm. But that's what we see clearly in our text here. Jesus didn't just heal diseases. He cured those who were troubled by unclean spirits, by demons. Now the whole area of this spiritual realm and demon possession specifically we can often have a lot of questions about it. The Bible doesn't give us, you know, a clear definition and, and many details about what it means. We know of some of the cases that Jesus confronted. There were two men that were demon-possessed. And they, they lived in houses, excuse me, not in houses, in tombs. And they went around naked. At times, the, the people of the area confined them, placed them under guard, even put chains on them. But we're told that the, the evil spirit would seize them and give them incredible strength so that they could break the chains and the shackles and, and run to deserted places. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus confronts a, a demon-possessed man and the demon makes him blind and mute. There's another case where we're told the man was mute because he was demon-possessed. Another case is a father comes to Jesus with his son who is demon-possessed and the demon causes seizures to happen and the child is in grave danger because he's fallen into the fire and into the water in these seizures. So what effect do demons have on our physical body? It's clear that they can give us supernatural powers and they can cause us to suffer things that we scientific people would look at and say, well, that's just a seizure. Or that's just blindness or muteness. Okay. Now, we've got to be careful. If someone's an epileptic, that doesn't mean they're demon-possessed because there is the physical ailment. But we also have to be careful that we don't rule out the spiritual dimension because it is just as real today as it was in Jesus' time. In fact, Paul would write this for us to keep in mind. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, he says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. See, it's not just the physical realm that we live in. We also live in a spiritual realm. And there's a battle going on around us and over us. And you can even say in us, which our physical eyes do not see. But just because we can't observe it, just because we can't measure it, doesn't mean that it isn't real. So there is a spiritual realm one that you are living in and acting in. But most importantly, one which Jesus rules. When we see Jesus confronting demons in, in the Bible, 
Nowhere does he have any problem dealing with them. And just as surely as the people of Jesus' day were able to be healed, cured of their demon possession and affliction, Jesus still rules that spiritual realm today. And that rule makes it clear that he is God. He is not just a man. He is God in the flesh. And he desires to heal. So yes, we can come to him with our physical ailments. And he can heal us. And we can come to him with our spiritual ailments when we're harassed by the devil. And he will heal us. And then he wants to bless us. Notice that Luke specifically says, in the midst of all this activity of healing, Jesus lifted up his eyes to his disciples. And then he said, Blessed are you who hunger now. Excuse me, I skipped one. Blessed are you who are poor, because yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who hunger now, because you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, because you will laugh. Blessed are you whenever people hate you, and whenever they exclude and insult you, and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Jesus wants to bless his disciples. Jesus wants to bless you. So what was Jesus meaning when he spoke of the poor and the hungry in, in these blessings? There is a, a temptation to put these categories into either the physical or the spiritual. Okay. So those that want to put it into the physical... They will say Jesus was speaking to the physically hungry, the physically poor, and therefore the church should be focused on the physically hungry and the physically poor. The other camp would say, no, these are just spiritual things. It's to be poor is to recognize your, your sinfulness and your unworthiness before God. To be hungry is to be to be hungering and thirsting for righteousness, which actually comes from the Sermon on the Mount. Okay. And so they want to keep these two things separate. Doesn't have to be separate. Jesus can be speaking about both. So maybe you, dear disciple of Jesus, you're struggling with financial difficulties. Blessed are you who are poor. Why? Because yours is the kingdom of God. In the, the midst of our financial struggles, the follower of Jesus remembers where Jesus is leading them. To heaven where the streets are paved with gold. That certainly speaks of the richness of heaven, but it also speaks of the real value of gold. In heaven, you walk on it. So, blessed are you, because you're a citizen of heaven. And, and maybe you're, you're hungering, and, and we can hunger in many different ways. It's not just food. We can feel empty within. Okay? We can feel as if our life has no purpose. That we're not getting anywhere. We can't necessarily put our finger on exactly what we want or what we need. But there's just a, a hollowness inside of us. If you feel like that, 
Jesus says, blessed are you because you will be satisfied. Jesus certainly satisfies that hunger in heaven where we eat and drink in the marriage feast or at the marriage feast of the Lamb who was slain. But Jesus also satisfies us now. You may not think that your life is worth much. You were worth so much to Jesus that he shed his blood. He died so that you could be his. You may think you're of little value, but that's not how Jesus thinks of you. He loves you. And he wanted so much for you to be his possession that he was willing to give everything so that your sins could be forgiven and so that you could eat with him at that table in heaven. And maybe your life doesn't seem to have much purpose. Jesus satisfies that too. Because the Bible is so clear that there is work that he has planned in advance for you to do. Not just for the righteous people in your mind or the extremely gifted people in your, in your mind. But if you are a disciple of Jesus, if you believe that he died for you, that, then there's special work that Jesus wants just you to do. And he's made you just right for that work. So yeah, that's a responsibility, right? I need to find the work that Jesus wants me to do. But that's also meaning and purpose. Your Lord and Savior, your heavenly King, has planned work just for you to do. So grab on to that work. And with that work, you will find meaning and rich reward. And that work may cause you to be persecuted. Nowhere does Jesus say that the work he has planned for you to do is going to be easy. In fact, he describes it as picking up a cross and following him. So in the midst of the difficulty, even with the richness of this meaning and purpose, we can really struggle. Jesus says, blessed are you. And he even says, rejoice because your reward in heaven is great. Once again, he directs our eyes back to heaven where we will see that everything that we suffer in this world because of Christ's name is going to be worth it. In fact, Paul even as he considered his own death, said, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So Jesus wants to bless you. He will get you through the difficulties of this life. You may struggle financially. There may be times it's hard to put food on the table. There'll be other times where you just feel like you're lacking inside. Jesus wants you to be full. He has come that we would have life to the full. And he's come so that we would have life in heaven. So keep your eyes on him. Fix your eyes on the one who died for you so that you can live for him. So the Sermon on the Mount may be the most famous one, but there's much that we can learn from the Sermon on the Plain. 
Jesus wants to heal physically and spiritually. Jesus wants to bless. May you find both in him. To him be the glory, now and forever. Amen. Please stand for the blessing. And now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen.